is this? It's about your story. Um, how, where did you grow up and what was the dream when you grew up? Okay. Uh, well, I grew up outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, the dream when I was little, or at least for a little while, was to, uh, I was a dancer. And then, and I wound up going to college in New York City, got injured, and that's what kind of got me started. Okay, I'm graduating college. My major was French and dance. And so now what am I going to do? Okay. And uh, I was always interested in the arts. I was always interested in travel, culture. But I didn't really know much about business. So I wound up graduating a little bit early from college and uh, doing some work uh, and then going to business school. And from there, uh, so at that point, my dream kind of changed. Again, I wasn't sure what it was. Okay. Uh, I didn't have something fixed in my mind. Uh, Wharton was a great school for learning. And when I got out, while I was at Wharton, I actually maintained some jobs in New York working in the arts, working for the New York State Council on the Arts, which is a, a um, government body that gives money to okay. performing arts, okay. performing and visual. Okay. I happened to work in the dance program. And uh, when I got out of Wharton, as other people were looking at investment banking and uh, management consulting, I actually went to work for the Martha Graham Dance Company. And uh, I became their director of development, their director of fundraising. Okay. So, uh, so there is not a lot of, uh, you know, if I look back, when you ask me that question, I think to myself, if I look back, there is, uh, my dreams always change. And most of the things that I'm doing, I might have bet you five years ago that I'd never be doing. So okay. uh, that's part of the interest of life, right? Yeah, I guess it is. And and I see the connection to, to, to your dance school. Initially, I was thinking why you graduated out of Wharton and went to a dance school, but now I yeah, see yeah, it, yeah. and that was your dream. Um, but, but, but you know what? It's, it, it's, uh, it was a great experience, and uh, I think a lot of times, because I was exposed to a lot of very powerful and artistic people. Okay. And um, one of the things that's true in fashion or luxury or beauty, but particularly in fashion and luxury, is that you typically have a creative force. Mm -hmm. So you have Tom Ford at Gucci, you have, uh, you know, they're kind of famous ones, Calvin Klein, um, Ralph Lauren, yes. but then you have the business side. Yeah. And so that duo is really important and understanding how to deal with someone who is a creative force and be the business person is actually, you know, uh, something that can serve you a lot. You can't do it um, unless you're in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. I understand. So how did, how did Wharton play um, a role in your life? Do, do you think that the school you went to mattered or would you, uh, would you say that maybe an MBA from another school would have changed things differently? Well, what I would say is that um, none of my parents ever went to college. Okay. Um, they were both, my father was very successful, but he was a self-made man. And so they always instilled in us that school is the most important thing, that it's a privilege. Uh, and so, and they, we always had a deal in our family, if we ever wanted to go to school, my parents would always figure out a way to pay for it, right? So what, I still have a lot of friends, and actually it's my 30th Wharton reunion this year. Uh, I still have a lot of friends from business school. Okay. I do not have a lot of friends from undergrad. So, you know, is it important? Yeah. Um, is it everything? I'm not sure it's everything because I know a lot of successful people and smart people who never went to graduate school. But I do think it is, it, for me, it gave me two things. It gave me a different perspective, which I really didn't have. I, did, I wasn't a business person when I went to Wharton. And... It also gave me an opportunity to uh, interact with a lot of very smart, opinionated people, mm -hmm. and uh, and that those smart, opinionated people 
Um, some of them are still my great friends, but a, having that kind of group is, I think, really important. They used to say, and this is long ago, I don't think they still say it, but they say, look, you're going to make a finite amount of mistakes in your life. The point of business school is to let you get some of those mistakes out of the way where it's not going to cost you anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That, that, that sounds fair. Um, I'll, I'll now jump to the next section of, of the questions as I So you work a lot with internet-based um, sort of marketing. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think, uh, or rather, how do you think it's different from uh, the physical marketing um, and the online marketing space? Or what do you see as the, as the basic? Well, let's uh, give a little history uh, okay. first. Because, you know, I've kind of, um, um, well, I built the clinic website in 1995, right? Okay. So yeah. the, the HTTP protocol for the web was only created in 93. So that means I was pretty early. But what the internet is a lot of things and we're not even sure. It continues to evolve. And so in my mind, all the times I was at Lauder, I was basically an entrepreneur. I was an entrepreneur in a big company. And so I would look for how, what are the different things that I could do to take great brands and enhance them in some way. Okay. Most of that was developing new businesses. But one of the the you know questions around the internet is well what is it? You know, a lot of people say, well what is it? Is it a sales channel? Is it a media channel? What is it? And I would say it's all of those things. Okay. It's an activity, you know, it's it, it's an area of play is the best way I put it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's almost like opening up a new market. If okay. you're a brand and you want to go online, you have to think of all the other things. So there are some things that are different online than offline, right? But those things are starting to get less and less. One of the things is that, you know, online can be more tactile. It's a more, it, it's a much more immersive experience if you're in retail. And immersive experiences lead to impulse purchases, and that's important. Uh, however... Uh, it's getting better. You know, you have some, you have some good merchandising companies uh, that are doing a great job, and it's not just about search. In the early days, it was just about search, and if you didn't know what you were looking for, and that's a problem for retail yeah. because a lot of times, particularly women, don't know what they're looking for. Yeah. So, so it, what I would say is, things are continuing to evolve, depending upon the category that you're in. The internet is either your lifeline or it's an enhancement to what you do. Uh, if you're in office supplies, it's your lifeline because nobody's ever going to walk in to buy office supplies again. They're not going to walk into retail. Yeah. So you better invest all your money in that. Mm -hmm. If you're in like the beauty business, it's, it, it has, it's, it's enhancing, it's convenient. It has a sense of um, opportunity and intimacy, but that you know, great merchandising um, makes you want to buy stuff. So you have yeah. to be, you have to understand both, and then play them to their best advantage. Okay. Okay. I understand. Um, the 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 little bit about women not knowing what they want is is really amazing because I've been in that place. I would go to a website on the internet and then I'd, I'd look for something and then the search just won't make its way and then I wouldn't know where else to go because I can't find what I want and then I don't know how to, how to navigate as well. Um, right. That, 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 that uh, yeah, that really hits home. Okay, what about luxury brands? Um, do you think that all sort of markets are, are suitable for, for luxury brands? A friend of mine works for, for a big... Um, well, consumer products company and she was talking about how luxury brands are entering markets like Indonesia, Vietnam, etc. And then I was thinking how are these are these markets really ready or how how would you make a decision to choose whether a luxury brand is is ready for a market? Well remember that luxury is about aspiration. 
Okay. And um, if I look at China, many would argue that that was really early, okay? Mm -hmm. It was probably too early. Mm -hmm. But you make an investment in helping to educate consumers about your brand. Mm -hmm. And we're living in the era of global brands, right? So depending upon the category, if you're in beauty, beauty is a category that is an affordable luxury. And so you can think about entering markets probably sooner than someone like Chanel might enter. So, uh, but it really depends on what your objectives are. And um, what people forget is just how much of the luxury business is driven by the aspirational consumer. So it's not the, the man or woman who can afford everything, but it's the one that wants to afford just one thing, right? Yeah. And so there's a lot of business being done by those people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when you look at it, I always like to look at market readiness, brand and market, and then if you're thinking about online, then online readiness. In other words, is it a developed yeah, online shopping culture or a retail shopping culture? That's part of the challenge with India, right? Yeah. India is a certain culture and they don't have the infrastructure. And that's why it's, yeah. it's not growing as quickly, right? Yes. Okay. Well, but what about, um, is, is that a saturation for a market like Singapore? You know, there's there's a Chanel in every mall. Yes. So what is the saturation point? I, you know, I was walking across the malls yesterday and I was really thinking, I was like, this is the exact same bag that's there 10 meters down the road. So, yes. Well, but that's because you're local. Now, yeah. remember that part of Singapore, a great deal of Singapore, is all about the tourism dollar and particularly the Chinese tourism dollar. Yes. So Singapore is a very mature market within Asia. It's been a great place to do business for multinationals for a long time, mm. uh, much like Hong Kong. So Hong Kong, it's the same thing. You know, it, they're everywhere. But part of it is a flagship strategy. So in okay. other words, if you, if you have a bunch of people that don't know what's important, the one that maybe screams the loudest could be what's important. And so there's a certain strategy for making sure you have the right space and location and you're in the best malls and you're in, you know, wherever people may go. The other thing is that when you are tourists, you don't go to every, you know, you have one day and maybe you do Orchard Street or maybe you're over by um, the Marina Bay Sands or whatever, right? Sure. That makes sense. What, what about um, culture that they had? Um, and you work a lot with, with the markets in China, right? Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you think people are taking online uh, shopping there? Online shopping is, of course, booming. It's getting ready to overtake the U.S. as the largest. But it's a very different market. Uh -huh. And it's a different market for a couple of different reasons. The first is, in China, although in cities like Beijing and, and uh, Shanghai, yeah. you have very developed retail infrastructure, uh, but in other cities, you may not, what's called the Tier 3 and Tier 4. Yeah. It's a very, very traditional uh, local retail, a little bit like Tier 4, a little bit like India. You know, yeah. there's a yeah. very local, it's not really a shop, it's the guy that yeah. has business and yeah. he carries everything from, you know, the oranges to the mops to whatever. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's part of what's driving online because suddenly they can get access. The next thing that's driving online is price. And uh, uh, so China grew up where the, let's say the U.S. grew up as a, what we would call a B2C, a business to consumer, uh, and C2C so the Ebays of the world, yeah. is about 25%. Okay. Uh, okay. It's not as big. China, it's the reverse. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, and part of that has to do with the Chinese mentality of, hey, I can put something up. I can sell it. And if I make 10 RMB more this week than I did last week, good for me. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and, and it's given rise to a, a, a number of budding entrepreneurs. 
Um, so it's, it's very different. And there's, as I said, it's still very much around price. And uh, okay. there are a lot of inherent challenges in local pricing. Mm -hmm. And the Internet uh, has, uh, it creates a lot of opportunity for people to arbitrage price. And then client-based relationships, if, if I'm right to assume that. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you know how um, the whole glass ceiling thing works in big organizations and then when you come to your independent work. Do you think something like this is it's, it's real, it's out there? Um, you know, I'm asking about the whole Sheryl Sandberg's um, assumption that, or, or I wouldn't say assumption, I, I do think it exists, but... Um, you know, how she feels that these things do exist, uh, but it is up to women to sort of take more place and take more seat at the table. So how has been your experience so far um, in all these years in the corporate world? Well, I had some great mentors. Okay. So, but you focus on the work. You don't focus on the power, and I don't agree with everything because I think yeah. she was given a lot of opportunities that many women are not. Yeah. Uh, but, is she's, she always says, don't leave before you leave. Yeah. And, um, and I'm a firm believer of that. Okay. You, you know, don't start uh, thinking about the next thing. Make sure this thing gets done. And, in fact, in everything that I've done, I always keep a picture of the last thing that I did. Okay. And that's to remind me where I was, but then also to remind me that I'm not doing that I'm going to go blaze a new trail. So I, I think that part's the most important part. Just focus on doing a great job. Okay. Okay, that, that's quite nice. Um, what about, uh, I'm just moving to the lighter questions now. What about traveling? I see that you enjoy traveling a lot. Um, uh, what are the most sort of interesting things that you've come across or maybe places? Um, there have been so many. I yeah. mean, you know, yeah. all, all the, there are still so many that I want to see. Yeah. I've been very fortunate because I do go back and forth to China, and China is a fantastic country. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a country with such a rich, rich topography, such a rich geography, uh, such a rich history. Uh, but there's still lots of places that I, ha I haven't been. Um, so, you know, I can, I can rattle off a bunch of places that are, you know, incredible places from Bali to Peru to the Amalfi Coast in Italy where I was married, et cetera, et cetera. But I think part of, you know, travel is about, um, seeing, trying to see the world through different eyes. And, uh, and that to me is the most interesting. It's not just about, oh, seeing the monuments and the, it's, it's talking to the people. And, and that's where language is important, you know, getting to understand how people think, how they're different, what their frame of reference is, et cetera. And I think that's uh, most interesting. And then, of course, you know, there are still a lot of places to see. Yeah. I still have a long list. My yeah. husband and I are always saying, okay, where are we going now? <laughs> okay. And, oh, and talking about languages, you're learning Chinese, aren't you? How's, mm -hmm. how, how's that? Well, <laughs> Right, and that took about six months for me to say that. So uh, it's it's uh, Han not Han Han not very difficult, right? Okay. But uh, I wish I could take a pill, uh, and I wish I could be better at it. But I, I like to say I'm on the five year program. Okay. I've been studying for eight months or t not, I think nine months now wow. since last July. So yeah. and. The good news is, though, when you're there, you get to practice, but also, mostly with cab drivers, but right. also you get, again, you start to understand more when you understand the language. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, what about your days? I, I, I can imagine uh, being an independent um, sort of consultant, you have, you have to plan your own time, you have to make sure you do your things, because no one's running behind you, it's sort of you running behind things, uh, making sure it all gets done. How do you, what are your productivity hacks? Well, what I would say is, the first thing is, even within the corporate world, yeah. because when I, I had a business, I had my own business before I went to work for Estee Lauder. Okay. And so, uh, 
I've always been the kind of task oriented, get things done kind of person. Okay. And when I was running a small business, you know, we, we got a lot of do done with a small team of people. Um, I've made a career of kind of identifying the next thing and then becoming the champion for that and bringing people along. And that requires a different kind of discipline. It requires a discipline to be able to not be embarrassed to say, okay, I don't understand that. Can you explain it to me? Mm -hmm. um, and to go to people to ask because you're not going to really learn and you can't be the champion unless you know. Yeah. So from a productivity standpoint, you know, we all go through periods in our lives where we're working seemingly insane, insane hours. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's some people who don't do that, but I don't know many of them. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and then things start to change. And I like to describe it as going up the mountain. Okay. So when you're, think about your career, you have maybe two or three stages. And the first is, if you're smart and you're ambitious, is when you're going up the mountain. And all you can see is the top of the mountain. So your number one priority is work and getting on top of the mountain. And everything around your life is it is what it is, but it's all about getting on top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. Once you achieve whatever it is, that, that goal that you've set for yourself, most people look around and go, oh, wow, it's really pretty up here. Look, there's that valley over there. That's really interesting. I never noticed that there. And so they start to, and that's when, in some cases, some people may get married, some people may, some people get married very early on, but they start to see other things in life. Yeah. For a yeah. very small few, and you can see them in their career, when they get on top of a mountain, they only just see another mountain, sure. right? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. so when you think about you know, how you organize your time or what you do, think about where you are in that stage. Are you in the stage of you just want to achieve this one thing? Mm -hmm. And it could be, I always say the, the most difficult time in starting your business is not the first year. Because yeah. in the first year, you're going up the mountain. All you want to do is just get this idea realized and start the company. Mm -hmm. The most difficult year is always the second year. Because now you have to beat what you did in the first year. Yeah. And yeah. now you're, you, you know, you may not be on top of the goal, overall goal that you set yourself, but you've gotten it done. You've started the company. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think about it in those terms. And then, you know, I'm a big... I'm a big list person. Okay. And my husband always says my lists have lists. I make lists for me. I make lists for him. Okay. It just helps me organize my thoughts. Yeah. And, yeah. and if you're dealing with, you know, in my advisory and also my investment work, you know, I, I work with a, a small number of companies, but very deeply with those companies. So I kind of have to keep track of all of them and what's going on. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm down to my very final question. So do you have... Um, an idea or a learning that you can say is this one gem of, of knowledge or <laughs> one gem that you have that you have learned or something like that along those lines that you would like to share with us? I have a couple. All I right. was thinking about this when I saw the question and I thought, well, yeah. I'm going to tell you two. I'm going to tell All you right. first the one that I've always tried to live by. And it was this kind of stupid little thing that I think my mother gave me when I was in my teens or something it was, you know, one of those little wall hanger things. And it says, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. And I've always tried, like in my work life, that's always what I tried to do. But the other thing that I would say is what you, I think that what you gain with experience is the difference between trying to achieve something and trying to grow people and trying to mentor people. So the more experience you have and the more perhaps success you have, I've always found it makes me more uh, interested in mentoring people, in seeing them succeed. I always said, you know, I want people to overtake me. I want my team to be better than I am. I want you know, I want to learn from them. I want to make them better, stronger, faster, um, happier, etc. So, and and I, as I said, I've had a couple of great mentors, and uh, and I'm still in touch with them, and I still feel very, very close to them because I know that I would never have achieved the success that I had without having them kind of 
guiding me and giving me that way of, of yeah. saying, okay, that's a, that's a clunker idea, but I'm going to let you do it so you learn. You know, uh, yeah. They always say if you're going to fail, fail fast and fail, fail you know, cheap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Uh, I really, really enjoyed, enjoyed this, this half an hour. Thank you so much for talking to us. Absolutely. A pleasure to talk to you.